I know, it's Ninny Poo. <laughs> oh, that's my line. That's right? Angel's line. That was from me. Because that's from the opening. And am I supposed to say just... that? Pourquoi es-tu obsédé avec moi? <laughs> <laughs> Which is French for, yes, why am I so obsessed with you? Because it's the point of the show. Right, right. <laughs> And now for today's story, starring for the first time ever, Miss Nanette Manoir, or in this case, her voice actress, Ruby smith Mervitz. Hello. Hey, thanks for being here today. So, I thought it was really, really cool that you are willing to reach out to me in general. What happened was, so people were asking how this happened. Mm -hmm. I reached out to you on Instagram, and mm -hmm. you were really kind enough to respond. Why That's not? <laughs> Why not? Actually, out of curiosity, I it's for the moment, but what were your first thoughts about somebody reaching out for the first time about this show in 20 years? Um, you're not the first, but I haven't had many people reach out, um, which is fine. Um, but uh, I think that I, I mean, cl I think the fact that you work in animation, um, I mean, look, I would have, I would have responded to anyone saying like, thanks for your message. Um, but the fact that you work in animation, um, I think made me realize that, um, there was perhaps more depth to your inquiry. Oh, that's really sweet. And, and the fact that you explained that you have such a, like you have, um, a sort of vested interest in the show and an intellectual connection with it. Um, not to say that people who simply like the show for liking it mm -hmm. have any, you know, less, um, intentional motives or whatever it is. But anyway, I think something the fact that you work in that you work in the field and that you are invested in it in a professional sense too certainly um gave more incentive to to uh message back and forth with you. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I'm really glad that you did. Mhm. Mm Since um I've said this a couple times to you already, but my own experiences with the show, I really like that Angela was able to get angry and express that. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the beginnings of the show and your involvement. So the show started out as a series of shorts on Kablam. You weren't involved with that specifically. You were involved no. with the actual series. Yeah. So what was the process of you getting cast, and what did they tell you about the show before that? Oh, right. Um, so something that you and I have talked about a bit mm -hmm. before is uh, Angela Anaconda was made in Toronto at a time when um, there were there were a lot of cartoon and animated series being made um, this was sort of okay I have to think about it in terms of how old I was so it would have been like 2001 mm -hmm. 2002 I think maybe two, even 2000 because we were talking about this I think I was 14 mm -hmm. when the show started, right? What did you say, 2000? Yes. The show started in 99. 99, so I would have been 14, yeah. So anyway, in that in that time period, there were just a lot of um, animated shows being produced in Toronto, and, uh, and so I fortunately kind of, that kind, I, I'd been acting since I was about eight. I come from this wacky, theater family and and basically that's how I started doing it my mom was a set and costume designer in mm -hmm. theater and my dad is a singer actor performer um, and so I really just fell into acting and um, and I so I did theater and TV and um, film and but I ended up sort of finding a niche if you will um, with cartoon shows um, and uh, particularly there were a few casting directors who just really liked me and so they were tasked they were casting a lot of the shows at the time and um, they were they did this one particularly there was a woman named Jessie and I can't remember her last name I actually meant to look it up which is bad hi Jessie if you're out <laughs> there somewhere um, and she was awesome she was really great and uh, yeah so she cast the show and she might have been a producer even because she was around a lot when we were recording and um that was that was really it I mean there were so many series going on at that time so at first Angela Anaconda just felt like another show that I was doing because mm -hmm. I was doing usually a handful of shows at a time okay um but Angela Anaconda it very quickly became clear that it was pretty special um you know I I 
again, had the great pleasure of working on lots of great shows. But Angela Anaconda was definitely my favorite. Um, and so I wasn't given, you know, I mean, it was kind of, it was, again, something we talked about that I was, you know, sort of a conflicted 14-year-old <laughs> teenager, very self-involved at the time and going through all my own stuff. And so I wasn't necessarily... Um, super invested in all of the acting stuff. I was mm -hmm. starting to question what I wanted to do with my life and all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but once we got into making the show is, is really when um, it, it took a larger part of my thinking and brain space, whatever it is. My heart. A larger part of my heart. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. And what were, the, what were some of the shows that you liked growing up? Right, so I had to think about this, and I'm glad that you um, provided me with the questions beforehand, um, <laughs> because I guess at that age, I, well, when I did the show, again, I was sort of a moody teenager, and I was, um, I wasn't watching a lot of TV, I was like listening to a lot of music and things like that, um, but uh, when I was younger, and particularly I was trying to think about what I was into when I was the age that Angela Anaconda was geared at, which of mm -hmm. course I was too old to watch. Um, that was your generation. That was me, yeah. yep. I was, I think, six when the show came out. Right, okay. So, um, but when, yeah, when I was a younger kid, like, first of all, we tended to watch a lot of these, like, great vintage cartoon reels, mm -hmm. like, on VHS tape. I have no idea where my parents found them. Um, but, uh, so that was something, like, sort of older Betty Boop and, 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 like, Looney Tunes stuff. Um, but then I also really loved things like Fraggle Rock. Um, and the Smoggies, okay. which I don't think, I don't know if you got that here. The Smoggies was this great, like, basically, like, almost eco-warrior oh. cartoon show about these creatures that lived under the sea, and they, uh, there was this, this group of humans, they were not humans, the, the Smoggies, <laughs> um, <laughs> there was this group of humans who lived on, oh, but maybe the Smoggies, anyway, they lived on a boat, and they polluted a ton. Okay. And and the, the creatures under the sea were always trying to like counteract their like polluting ways. That sounds like Captain Planet, because that's what we had in the States. Huh. So the kids from There was no superhero though. Oh, okay. They were just like little creatures that lived under the sea who were constantly trying to mess with the, the polluters okay. ways. Very eco friendly. Yeah, that, Cause there were a lot of eco friendly shows in the eighties and nineties. Yep, it was a great time. Do you remember um, Fern Gully? Yes, fantastic. <laughs> Watched that in second grade. Yeah, so good. But then there were like more, more noticeably, um, there were movies that I really liked. Oh, also we talked about you can't do that on television. I love that. Um, but yeah, I feel like movies for whatever reason sort of were more important to me. So I, I loved Clueless. Um, but I also loved The Addams Family and Nightmare Before Christmas. And when I thought about Nightmare Before Christmas, um, it's not the same as Angela Anaconda, but it has a sort of gothic, um, interesting sort of aesthetic similarity yeah. to Angela Anaconda, isn't it? Anyway, the thing yeah. about Angela Anaconda, and it was totally different than, than anything else. So I would say it still is. Yeah, there was no connection really to stuff that I personally liked. Um, it was, it was this totally different new thing and it was just so much more, um, intellectual and sort of more like intellectually challenging to kids. A lot of shows don't necessarily go there with kids, you know, a lot of, it, to, to challenge them on an intellectual level. And that was something that was really cool about Angela Anaconda. Awesome. And you grew up voice acting with Bryn McCauley, who was Gina Lash, and Al Lucadam, who was Johnny Abadi. Mm -hmm. And did you ever record with any of the other cast members? I know you didn't record with Sue Rose directly. No. Because she recorded her stuff in, in the States, I think, probably here. Mm -hmm. um, on other shows, we would do big group reads um, or group recordings. Um, we recorded all of these shows that were being made, things like, you know, the other big shows that were being done at the time were The Magic School Bus and Franklin and All the Tales from the Crypt Keeper. Those were all, all these shows were recorded at the same studio in Toronto. Um, and I can't remember what it was called, but it was this really cool little space. It was tucked away behind. Um, it wasn't at Core Digital Pictures? It wasn't recorded there? I know no. that's where Angela was made, but I don't know if that's where it was Oh no, recorded. they were never, the shows were never recorded in the same places that they were made. 
Because Core was the, um, yeah, that was the design house that created it, right? Mm -hmm. So that was like a whole separate part of, um, of the process. Then everything would be recorded in a recording studio, um, a, a totally different facility. And it's too bad I can't remember what it's called because I, I was there all the time. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there was this like great big room that had all these um, like Persian rugs on the floor that we did lots of group recordings for shows like Franklin we often recorded as a group um and that was like Ali McAdam was also on that show um but for Angela Anaconda I don't remember ever doing a group recording I always okay. did my stuff on my own okay that's interesting yeah yeah and you, you often sound like you're having fun on the show totally you're saying all the weird lines uh, did you relate to Nanette in any way, or was it simply fun to play the mean girl before that character became as popular as it did? Right. Again, getting into, we're really, like, <laughs> psychologically deconstructing these characters there, aren't we? Um, and I, this was one that I, I definitely, like, had to give a bit of a think to. Um, I did not, I did and I didn't relate to her. Um... For the most part, not. For the most part, it was just fun to play Nanette because she had all these lines and I could go absolutely as, like, valley girl <laughs> as, as, as possible. And, and I, I'm certainly aware of the fact that my voice has a tendency to go in that way. Um, so, yeah, the lines were just really fun to read and to, to be as sort of extravagantly ridiculous as she is sometimes. Um, but... I didn't, I didn't relate to her sort of beyond um, some of the superficial stuff. I, I think I, I already had an affinity for everything French at that age. Um, and you actually speak French. I do, yes. Um, but at that time, I didn't. My French has improved a lot since I played Nanette. <laughs> but I understand. I mean, growing up in Canada, you do, um, you do take French in school. Up until, I mean, I took French in school up until grade 11, so I was, like, 16. So I understood, like, I understood how incorrect most of her French lines were. Um, but uh, back to the question of whether or not I related to her. Not really. Not really. To, to me, and I think, I wonder if this is a difference with voice acting mm -hmm. than, um, you know, other kinds of acting, which is that it's just, you're not wholly embodying the character. Mm -hmm. You're just lending one element okay. of yourself. So it's it's I don't I don't know I mean this is just my my you know perspective on it. Other voice actors might feel differently. Mm -hmm. But um it's not your character does not it, it, it you don't have as many shared qualities, right? Because it's not your right. body or your face or anything. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> and was she there... was mean. She was <laughs> really mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're not like that. <laughs> oh, God, I hope I'm not like that. Not at However, all. However, I will say this, which is that, um, you know, I start, again, I started acting when I was really young. Mm -hmm. And um, you are really pampered as mm -hmm. a child actor. Okay. You're shuttled around. You're constantly being sort of coddled, if you will. You know, people are constantly asking you if you need anything and... And so I think that there are some interesting parallels with the way that Nanette seemingly is, you know, what her experience of life or how she's raised. You know, she's obviously a total spoiled brat. Um, and, and so I think there's some funny parallels between the fact that I was a child actor, uh -huh. a bit spoiled in my life in certain ways, playing this very spoiled bratty character. I don't know. My siblings might have a different <laughs> perspective on that. <laughs> and speaking of that, was there a line that was particularly fun to say? Oh, the one that always stuck with me was yeah. just stop being a pomme de terre, Angela. <laughs> because the French translation is so horrible. I'm sure many of you know by now that a pomme de terre is a potato and not an apple polisher. <laughs> You know, Angela, I was going to write about Mrs. Briggs, but I didn't want everyone to hate me for being a pomme de terre, which is French for apple polisher. <laughs> which is, of course, she was always, and Annette was always accusing Angela of being, of, of sucking up to Mrs. Briggs, right? In their ongoing war for classroom superiority. Yeah. So, I always loved that. All of her, all of her bad French lines were amusing. <laughs> uh, they are fun. Yes. 
And Nanette's always in the revenge fantasy, so you had to scream a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the way we recorded that was um, my least favorite thing about doing um, about doing about doing voice acting, which is that they uh, at least they used to. I would assume this is still probably common practice, but every actor, principal actor, will record a like a sound reel essentially, which is you just do a series of reaction sounds. So like ah. Oh my god, or whatever, like, and you just sort of do them successively without context, and it's so they can cut things in after when they need stuff. And so, most like, I very seldomly actually recorded the revenge fantasies as a scene because they weren't really scenes for Nanette, no, they're just a series of her reaction sounds. So, that's the kind of stuff that would go into the into oh, the revenge fantasy. Interesting, because I thought, because it's over and over and over again, I thought you would have to do take after take. No, no, no. no. So they, they've got stuff like that on, 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 on ice, if you will. You know, they've, they've okay. got like, they've got all of that, those sort of sounds stored and they can just cut them in as they need them. Okay. Yeah. So it was just <laughs> the same take over and over again. No, no. I mean, I would have done, especially because some of them, you know, will require special things. So, I probably would have recorded like a series of reaction sounds like mm -hmm. once, like probably every other recording session maybe, unless maybe there was a, I'm sure there were times when specific revenge fantasies required a certain kind of reaction sound. Okay. But she doesn't have any dialogue in them. Usually. Not really. It's Angela doing all the talking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, the fans actually had some questions as well. Yeah. So this... Actually, I got a message from Ed Chi, who's a prop designer on the show. He's yes. equally a big fan of your work. He had this to say. I wanted to, before his questions, he wanted to say this. Uh, for Ruby, I'd like to tell her there could not be another Nanette memoir besides her. She created such a great, memorable character Aww. for the show. I can't remember if, if there was, but I'd love to see an, Angel an episode of Angela that is strictly Nanette, A Day in the Life of Nanette Memoir. Though, considering the theme song, she says, this is my story and not starring Nanette Memoir. And now to today's story, starring me and not starring Nanette Memoir. <laughs> I don't right. think Angel would have allowed at the time. Counter to the whole concept <laughs> of the show. That's nice that someone would have liked to see a whole episode of Nanette. Um, I wonder how many people share that <laughs> feeling. Although, I think quite a bit, considering there is... A love, unironically, for the mean girl characters, for the bitchy characters. Right. Although I think personally, I think yeah. it's good to keep them off to the sidelines <laughs> a bit. Um, I mean, the other thing is that, like, a good villain—you can't humanize a good villain too much, because then you start to empathize with them, and they become mm -hmm. an anti-hero, right? You know, like Tony Soprano is a great example. Mm -hmm. He's like one of the most evil characters in in television history and yet because of the way they presented the show yeah. everybody like loves him right even though he's this horrible person so I mean I think bottom line regardless of like anything else that people think about Nanette she's a great villain I'd say so you know she's, a... she's like over the top she's horrible she's mean um, but she's hilarious but she's really evil I don't know but I don't know if I'd say that I think she is. You think so? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like a, a, a huge reason why it was so fun to play her. So, um... I think it's I more know. just how Angela sees her more than that's what she really is. Oh, no, I think she is awful. Yeah? That's how I always played her. Oh, interesting. I mean, look, she's got... Her whole thing, they're like, her family, they're all awful, evil people. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, not to dive too deep into... Uh, the context, but in terms of like stereotypes and uh -huh. socioeconomic like issues, mm -hmm. you know that was that was something that uh, I think was an important element of the show is that um, there is the the implication that mm -hmm. Nanette comes from this very like stereotypical Caucasian wealthy mm -hmm. world where people can go to the dark side. Um, you know, too much privilege, mm -hmm. too much wealth. Um, oh, 
I mean, Nanette is an embodiment of white privilege. That's true. Um, and her parents seem to be horrible people. I mean, Bunny, Myanmar, <laughs> oh God, right? She, her, the, I actually just reviewed an episode where she tries to burn the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, like, they're awful people. I don't remember what the dad's name is. Howl. <laughs> God. I'm watching the show. <laughs> Which why? Why like that? That to me. Anyway, I love the names in this show. Not to get too political, but then you know, Nanette, or sorry, Angela mm -hmm. is I think a great example of like what most people's lives are like, right? Very like middle class. You sometimes get the sense that they didn't have a lot of money, even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Anaconda family, and yet they're these like nice, warm-hearted, kind of wacky people. Frankly, my family was a lot like, and more like Angela's than it was Nanette's. Um, you know, I have these like wacky siblings who are athletes who were like always like play wrestling at home. <laughs> and, and you know, my, my mother was always a little bit frazzled. Um, and, uh, and so um, I think that that adds up to, again, for me, painting a more one-dimensional, mm -hmm. less relatable character in Nanette, which again is important okay. for her to be a good villain. She has to be less relatable than your main character. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. So it's my two cents. Okay, so you relate <laughs> more to Angela than Nanette. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I, I, I don't know. Again, because of I think because I was always very aware that I was not the demographic that the mm -hmm. show was aimed at, I was just there to play Nanette <laughs> and, like, and like make it funny. So I didn't necessarily relate to any of them more or less, um, but uh, it, was, it was sure fun to, to be evil. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But as a character, I liked Angela better because she was real and she was smart and she was like, you know, I mean, I was raised to be a sort of riot girl feminist. And, and Angela is that. And I think Sue Rose and Joanna Farone are that, too. I th yeah. Sue Rose, I, I think, is more that way. I've seen some of her posts. Yeah. Do yeah, I yeah. I'm not as sure. Well, again, we've talked about this a little bit, which um, I don't think you're familiar with, but Pepper Ann. I am. Oh, you are familiar that with Pepper Ann. That's Sue Rose's show. Yeah. So, so that was, um, Pepper Ann was almost more my generation because it came before, so I was younger mm -hmm. when it came out. And so I was already familiar with this kind of, like, um, a bit like punk rock. It's like a bit of a punk rock approach bit, to cartoon yeah. making, and so I already liked the I liked the 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 um whatever I don't know the ilk of that stuff. It's awesome. Yeah. Okay, I thought it'd be fun to do some reactions. So a little while ago, I made a small tribute to Nanette, and <laughs> I did share it with you. Yes. Thought because, and I did include your favorite line in here. It's a good line. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to do a bit of a reaction right now. Enjoy the show, Angela Anaconda. <laughs> the evil laugh you do is great. Come, John. Let nothing hold you back. <laughs> you heard the captain tell you, buddy. Hey, there's an important ingredient missing from my crepe Suzette, which is French for overpriced pancakes. Love that line. You know, which is French for overpriced <laughs> what? Pancakes. Pancake. Oh, I mean, how smart is that, right? Right? Who it's wrote French that? episode to record. That's my favorite episode, at least one of them. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a really fun episode, and you could tell that that was like, it's almost like a bit of a, like a relief, I think, <laughs> probably for the writers, first and foremost, but then everyone else, that Nanette stops being this like horrible, cloying um, uh -huh. character, and, and you sort of see, I mean, I'd say that's almost the closest that you get to seeing a different kind of humanity from her, right? Which is that she's rebelling from her 
from from these things that we as a society have decided are like enviable and perfect you know her like whatever crazy family um but then she's like rebelling i think everyone loves to see a rebel <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny the because it's so different from her usual shtick. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That episode had some of the funniest lines. Yeah, yeah, and it was very fun to record because I got to use different, I got to use different parts of my voice. Mm-hmm. I got to kind of embody a bit of a different vibe, you know, not so like. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> you know, she spoke a little lower, like um, oh. name's Bruiser now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was fun. That's a, easily one of the funniest episodes, actually. Yeah, that's that's the one where my favorite line is from. So when I'm old enough, I'm, I'm gonna run away and become a waitress, waitress. At, a, at a truck stop. At a truck stop. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's great. It's good stuff. That's awesome. The other thing, a lot of fans really like the episode where you sing. Do you remember the episode where they're in a band and you used to have this song? I'm, I want to be a little French girl. I do. Wow. This seemed pretty good. I hate to admit it, but I agree with John. <laughs> <laughs> Love those designs too, the hairdos. Oh yeah. I definitely had forgotten about that until seeing it. I mean, a few things. First, I mean, I loved Motown growing up. Uh-huh. And so the whole, like, reference to the Supremes with those outfits is fabulous. Um, and then I do remember recording it because, so, while I was doing this show, and particularly when mm-hmm. I was, like, 14, 15, 16, I was in a serious children's choir, um, oh. And uh, it's the Canadian Children's Opera Chorus. Shout out CCOC <laughs> to anyone who knows what that is. But it's um it's like the it's affiliated with the Canadian Opera Company in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And um and I was like way more into singing and my mm-hmm. choir life than I was into doing my voice acting okay. at that point. So, but I actually got really nervous to record that episode because. Um, I, I always got really nervous about singing, actually. Like, I, tr- I attempted to do, like, singing competitions and things like that, and I would totally sabotage myself because I'd get Aww. so anxious and nervous and, like, couldn't breathe and couldn't sing. And um, so putting my singing down on tape was, like, way scarier to me than what we were doing on a regular basis of just recording the show. And seeing it again, you know what? It came out pretty well. I think so, too. I'm pretty happy with actually, that. Actually, a lot of the people... A lot of people who see that say, wow, and that's a very good singer. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's kind of talk singing. It is. But there, there, are a couple good, there are a couple good melody lines there. Right? Funny. It's catchy. <laughs> that's nice if people like it. Oh, so I'd say fun. so. I mean, I'm just, I'm, you know, the stuff that you are reminding me of through our conversations mm-hmm. um, and stuff that I haven't thought about in so many years, it just keeps on reminding me that this show was so clever and so smart and so well written. Like those lines. What was it? Um, so gauche to be anyway. Oh, yeah. like, they use all we'd... the terms so well and so like properly anyway. As if we'd ever be so gauche as to wear them in the actual theater. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you have to understand the the term gauche to write that in properly, right? Like they were yeah. just so good. Shout out to the writers. Someone knew French on the staff. Definitely. I thought it'd be fun since. I did collect some fan questions for Yeah, thanks the show. everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks guys. So this first one is from prop designer Ed Chi. And Hi Ed. Hi Ed. I feel like I know you, but I know we <laughs> haven't ever met. <laughs> so he says, oh, what the voice acting co- wants to know what the voice acting community is like for you in LA. He said, I've seen the closeness of some of the Overwatch actors, etc. What's it like from her experience? Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I haven't followed intently. But it, she is still voice acting, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> right. Too. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, Ed. But I, no, I basically stopped acting full stop. Um, like, Angela Anaconda was one of the last things I did. I, like, 
literally told my agent I was retiring when I was 17. Wow. Um, and uh, I just, I, like I said, I fell, in, I felt like I fell into it all because of my parents having, um, you know, such deep ties to the theater world and that progressed to, you know, me doing stuff beyond theater. Um, but when it came time to me, like, striking out on my own and really trying to decide what I was going to pursue for my post-secondary education and things like that. I, um, I mean, I'd stopped doing on-screen acting even way before, like probably around the time that I was doing the show, 14 or 15. And I, I was only doing voice acting for the last okay. few years, um, of, of my, uh, my career. <laughs> um, and so, no, I don't act anymore. Um, and I have no idea what the voice acting community is like here, but Overwatch is a video game, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so that's cool he mentions that because I have thought that mm -hmm. maybe now that I live in L.A. I should dip my toe into it again, mm -hmm. but um, no promises there. <laughs> okay. And he has another follow-up question. If oh, you did, right. If you did go back into acting, what dream character would you like to play you haven't played yet? I don't know. It's been so long since I've mm -hmm. inhabited that space for myself. I've spent the last like 10 years basically trying to, to learn everything I can about wine. As you know, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, I now work as a wine professional. And so That's really cool. I just went such a different direction. Um, and I don't know if I could even answer that because I just don't think of myself as an actor anymore. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, cool. Although every year I'm tempted to dress up as Cher Horowitz from Clueless, so I don't know. <laughs> no one's stopping you. <laughs> oh, well, this is from ZK Art, who's the cosplayer got famous for right. her Angela costume. Right. Is your voice ever recognized by people? No. No, it's not. I don't, I mean, some people, even when they hear me as, An as Nanette, um, they're like, oh, I couldn't really tell that, that was you. So I think people are not that good at, in general, of, mm -hmm. uh, of picking up on things like that. Um, but that's a nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and these are from Russell Williams. If Angela and Annette went to college together, what would your opinion be on their majors? Would they get along? Would they still hate each other? Would they be best friends? Hmm, good question. I mean, I... I am sure that Nanette would be a sorority girl. Ooh, um, yeah, I, I mean, I can see Nanette kind of evolving into, have you seen Scream Queens? I know of it. So Emma Roberts oh, plays okay. this total like mean girl head of a sorority. I feel like that's, and she has underlings like January and Carlene. Oh, yeah. She basically forces all of the, you know, all of, oh, they're all called, oh God. Scream Queens is a great show. Anyone out there? Ryan Murphy, <laughs> what up? Um, and uh, and it's actually so similar to the dynamic that Nanette has okay. with January and Carlene. And they wear like marabou and and like they're like modern day Nanette, January and okay. Carlene. Okay. So I feel like that's what Nanette would be like if she went to college. Mm. What would she study? Probably something she has no intention of ever using <laughs> as a profession afterwards. So like you know. I don't know, astrology. <laughs> Obviously, you can't study that at, at college, I know. I can actually see her doing that. I can no, see Jen and Carlene know. maybe more so. I, um, I mean, part of, and this also feeds into a, another question that you, you posed, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, what would, was it, what was it, what would Nanette be doing with her life today? Yes. I think part of the fun for me, I'm hesitant to even go there okay. to picture what they would be like in a different context, setting, era of their lives. Because I think, um, like, especially the revenge fantasy element feeds into this whole thing that the show was so sort of fantastical uh -huh. and like an alternate reality and just like so super fun to watch. And, um,. I, I feel like contextualizing the characters in a different way would almost like ruin that fun escapism of the show a bit for me. Okay. So I'm I'm inclined to just leave them where they where they are okay. in, in this this make believe world of Angela Anaconda. <laughs> okay. And second question from Russell Williams: Does Nanette have an obsession with Angela as well, or does Nanette like her in a sense? 
Oh, I think Nanette is like the most self-absorbed person on earth. I don't think she thinks about anyone else. <laughs> Maybe hilarious. her dog. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is like part of being a true villain, right? Because you can't be evil if you're too aware of other people because then you'd start empathizing with them and start being a nice person. <laughs> there are people out there who do empathize with Nanette. Oh, and do see sorry. A bit of, <laughs> and see a bit of a humanity to her. I think that's great. I mean, I can see that. There are some lines um, where she sort of like opens cracks of her, her own humaneness mm-hmm. or humanity. Um, but no, I don't really think she, I mean, for her to treat January and Carlene the oh. way she always did, um, is oh, yeah. not very, not very, uh, feeling for her, her fellow human beings. I don't think that's a real friendship to begin with. It might just be a friendship of convenience since they're all, I think they're all rich. Well, we've talked about this and, and similar tropes of like other mm. mean girl crews, like yeah. mean girls, um, and the Heathers. The Heathers and the Ashleys on, oh, yeah, yeah right? And, um, I mean, you always kind of saw this in school anyway, girls who banded together um, for different reasons. And, um, unfortunately, society does some pretty ugly things to women. Uh, and so I think, again, unfortunately, Janu and Carlene probably looked up to Nanette for whatever reason because she's this image of, like, what we've decided is societal perfection, mm-hmm. white, blonde, wealthy, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so who knows what their situations were like. We could, right? we, that might be more interesting to psychologically deep dive January and Carly huh. and why they, why they followed Nanette around. Anyway, I would say it was probably for leverage. They thought they were bettering themselves somehow ah. by like following her around. That's a good reason. And like- then she just treated them like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as... Some friends do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and this one's from Hulkarine 100. Similar to Favorite Lines, it says, I'm so excited, please ask Ruby what her favorite episode featuring Nanette. Right. Um, honestly, they were just all super fun. And and as I mentioned to you before, I don't have a ton of like really clear memories. Um, it was a long time ago now. Um, and again, I was like, you know, this like self-absorbed hormonal angsty teenager when I was doing this so um I uh it just felt like this super fun thing to I would leave school every Thursday afternoon um to go to the recording studio and I'd record my episode you know it was like I said it was once a week um that I didn't know yeah when we were in production there were breaks of course in between seasons and things like that um but uh yeah, so I would just go and and record these super fun lines. <laughs> and maybe because of the way we recorded them, which was that uh, I, I, I can't say for sure if the other actors always recorded their stuff solo as well, but it would be a time that I'd just, you know, I'd go into this the little box of the recording studio and um, I'd just say these funny lines. And so I didn't... I didn't, you didn't, you don't get like the clearest vision of an episode that way necessarily, you know? Um, so the, the actual, that final like impact of a great episode is probably mm-hmm. more strongly felt by the viewers than necessarily right. when you're recording it. It makes sense. But I did love the, the bruiser episode <laughs> when she, yes. yeah, that was, that was super fun. Cause that one's <laughs> hands down you at your funniest. Oh, thanks. Oh, absolutely. It was great material. <laughs> yeah, because they really let you shine. They let you do something different. They let yeah. you go nuts. It's yeah. usually Sue Rose and Angela who gets to go nuts, but yeah. this one really gave you the chance. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. It's a good point. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Plus, it's also funny seeing such a switch in Nanette's personality, seeing the fake biker act. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Going outside the lines. Absolutely. Okay. This Brian Nussbaum has three... Uh, we've already Go covered. For it, Brian. Yep, we've already covered your favorite Nanette quote or phrase throughout the series. And what did you think of all the hate based on Angela Anaconda since the show got a bit of a backlash in the last few years due to the art style? Right. I think that was likely due to the tie-in with Digimon that wasn't marketed to a lot of people, and fans of Digimon didn't want to see a short. 
This I'm going to have to refer to you yeah. probably. On. Okay. Again, because um, because I've been kind of out of the picture of okay. what the following of Nanette is, or sorry, Angela Anaconda, the show, mm -hmm. um, what, what that following looks like today. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of these feelings um, on the internet. I will say this, though. I mean, the way the internet works now with YouTube and Twitter, mm -hmm. it's a platform for everyone to voice their opinion. Yes. And people who have a negative opinion, I think we're all aware of this now, that people with negative opinions are a lot okay. more inclined to air them on yes. the internet than all those people out there who are perfectly happy with something. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. That's wonderful. And nothing is ever going to please everyone either. Um, you know, you look at films that win Best Picture for the Academy Award, and there are tons of people out there who hate that film. So, um, I don't know. I wouldn't worry about it. That's awesome. Pay no heed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Especially because there are so many fans out there still, and there are plenty of people who do like the show. I mean, the other thing about Angela Anaconda is that it is really unique, as, as we are all aware of. Everyone oh, yes. who, you know, has has ever seen the show, and especially probably people who really like the show, um, are aware of its uniqueness. And things that are unique or like boundary pushing or, um, you know, distinctive in any way are often going to have more strong negative reactions from people than things that are kind of like middle of the road, basic, mediocre, whatever it is. That There's a reason that that McDonald's is as popular as it is, right? Um, and so Angela Anaconda is not for everyone. And that's a great thing about it. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. You have such positive feelings about that. Oh, my gosh, of course. I'm immensely proud of the show. Um, and I'm obviously just a tiny part of it. Um, I am so happy that I got to be, that I got to be part of, of this thing that I think was so cool. And I'm like so happy to see that so many people still, that it resonates with people. I mean, we're talking now, like, <laughs> okay, we're talking almost 20 years after yes. we started making the show. Um, no, it is 20 years this year, I guess, right? Yes. Yeah, it started in 99. So for something to have that kind of longevity is pretty amazing. That's awesome. Mm. And final request from Brian Nussbaum. Would you be able to say a sentence or phrase as Nanette? Oh, right. Okay, so why don't you, I'll, I'll do whatever, you, I'll say whatever you tell me. How to. about, how about, uh, how about my favorite line, so when I'm old enough, I'm going to run away from home and become a waitress at a truck stop. Okay, let me try to remember the, the particular bend of that line. Um, also, look, I'm under no illusions here. I recorded this when I was a 14-year-old, <laughs> and I'm now in my mid-30s, right? So my voice does not sound the same. But <clears throat> when I grow up, I'm going to run away and become a waitress at a truck stop. <laughs> I hope that satisfies you, Brian. <laughs> All right. And this one, I think, going off of what we said earlier, talking about the internet reactions to the show. So I'm somebody who makes videos weekly about the show, talking about it. Right. Trying to show people the positives in it since... People have been talking about the negative sides on it on the internet for so long. Mm. Fans really haven't come out of the woodwork, so, so that's something I've been doing. So Drew at one or Steven would like to know what you think of my channel and essentially reintroducing people to Angela Anaconda in a positive way rather than a negative way right. like a lot of people have. Well, um, Alexandra, I think what you do is great, and I... I I am so enchanted by your passion for this show okay. um, and, uh, and that you, um, I think that this show is a really interesting vehicle for looking at lots of different societal issues. So I, you know, I think it's great that you use your plat, you know, the fact that we all have a platform on the internet now mm -hmm. um, to, to talk about these things. Um, yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's great that you exercise your interest in it and are creating this online community around it, or, or at least you know, cultivating this and helping to support the online community. I just realized that I haven't necessarily asked what the specifics of the negative reaction are. You mentioned the animation style, 
what beyond that do people seem to have such issue with? Most of it is the art style. I think a lot of it came to the Digimon movie short, which wasn't marketed and fans didn't really want to see anything other than the movie. But the usual... Wait a second. What do you mean the Digimon short? There was a short before the Digimon movie... Oh. That, that aired in theaters that was not marketed people weren't expecting and there was really no connection between the two mm, interesting because what year was that 2000 i think so it was right near the beginning of the series it was probably in the middle i'd say so people probably didn't know the series very well okay um and uh yeah i'm sure you're right that but like were people upset that they had to sit through this well what was it have been yes. five minutes or something before this movie. Yes, because they didn't expect it. And, and fans of the Digimon movie just wanted to see Digimon. They didn't want to see anything else. So do people still talk about that? Yes. I'd say people <laughs> should get over it, first of all, because that was almost 20 years ago. Um, but second of all, I mean, that would have been a huge, like, that would have been a huge great thing for the show to nail this spot before a Digimon movie, uh -huh. first of all. Like, I think that that, you know, that was a great success for Angela Anaconda to get this slot. Um, and, I mean, Digimon's not around anymore either, I don't think, is it? It actually is. There is still a fan base. I don't but know. But the show's not being made anymore. I'm not entirely sure. I know it's a franchise. I actually know so little about Digimon. I know more about that people didn't want the short. That's talking to fans, seeing the internet reaction. Mm -hmm. The only other thing people really criticize consistently is Sue Rose's performance. The voice. Oh, really? Yeah. Mostly the mostly the singing. Oh, but it was bad on purpose. Oh, it was? Of course it was. Oh. Oh. Na, 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 na. I didn't know that. Na, 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 I thought na, it was na. just character. No, and quirky. I mean I think Sue Rose is well aware of the fact that she has a very funny sounding voice. But oh. she look I mean, she created these great outlets she for did. her for her funny sounding voice and her creativity around shows like Pepper Ann and Angela Anaconda, right? Like, um, I don't think she was ever attempting to have a beautiful singing voice. <laughs> oh, well, I, I missed that one. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, the big but, thing, the animation and her voice are really the two big things about it. Everything else, I think people are just we're just looking for a reason to be angry. The revenge fantasies, that's mm -hmm. just people misunderstanding the show. I think people were just looking for a reason there. Those are, yeah, those are the two big ones. Animation, Digimon Short, the vo Angela's voice. People right. actually, people have loved your performance. That's what I've consistently oh, that's so seen. Nice. So nice. But again, I don't even know that that's necessarily right. something to celebrate over. Like, I know. Like, again, because Nanette was this embodiment of everything that we think we're supposed to celebrate in Western culture, right? Again, mm -hmm. the, like, whiteness of her, the privilege, the... Um, I mean, I have a pretty sing-songy voice, which mm -hmm. is, you know, if you want to delve into, like, feminist tropes and, and the way that we have programmed ourselves to react to women, um, frankly, like, Angela is a much more interesting, realistic portrayal of what females are like in the world, right? Mm -hmm. She's unusual. She's, I mean, most, everyone's unusual. None of us are alike, right? In our natural state. She's, um, like, there's a lot more to be celebrated, I would say, with Angela, the character. Um, and I think that's what Sue was getting at uh, okay. with her, you know, un, unstereotypical looks, her, her unstereotypically feminine behavior, her tomboyishness, and her funny singing voice. Oh, I thought the design was be to make her the every girl, because I looked like that as a kid, and so many other girls did, too. I thought right, that's sure. what the point Especially was. Especially young kids. Like, little girls are often very sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, they don't necessarily look extremely feminine. They, they like to scrap it out and play in the dirt and whatever it is, mm -hmm. and usually only wear dresses if their parents make them. Um, so, anyway... We could go uh, on. Huh. <laughs> but that's oh, probably, wow. honestly, I would I would go so far as to say, like, backlash against the character of Angela mm -hmm. um, is somewhat, like, misogynist. Because I'd say there are a lot of people out there who don't like it that Angela is not a typical little girl in the stereotypical sense. Wow. I interpreted that very differently. That's I'm, You're definitely right on that. I might be. I don't know. <laughs> I always thought it was people misunderstanding anger and misunderstanding, hey, there are good reasons to be angry sure. and she has a right to feel this and way. And that's part of it, right? We built this, this construct around 
femininity where women are not supposed uh -huh. to be angry. We're not supposed to use our voices. We're not supposed to be loud or disruptive. And oftentimes people of bully people who are bullying victims are told, "Oh, you're the you have to apologize. You have to suck it up. You have to change." Right. Instead of just telling the bully, "Don't be a bully." Yeah. I think and a right. lot of boys related to that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. So, again, I mean, we've talked fairly at length, Alexandra and I, about how progressive the show is in a feminist way, and, and I think this speaks further to it. And I would, I would say that, sadly, a lot of the online backlash is probably because mm -hmm. we see it again and again that in society, in every corner of society, that when women don't act the way we want women to act, mm -hmm. people get upset. Hmm. <laughs> Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So screw them. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were a lot of people who felt disenfranchised and really related to her. Because this predates the anti-bullying movement. This predates... Because yeah. people at this time didn't think that girls bullying was nearly as bad as boys bullying because it wasn't as easy to spot. Bullying was barely ever even discussed at school when Never. I was a kid. Ne not really when I was a kid either. Yeah. I was always told... No, I, the, I was bullied by someone. I was forced to hang out with them anyway, even yeah. when I made it clear. Really? I yeah. Right. I was bullied by some yeah. girls at school, um, yeah. a couple of them. Like, And maybe I drew inspiration from <laughs> those mean girls to play Nanette. Um, but whatever it was, I, I loved I, – maybe I felt like I was, um, you know, uh, what's the word? When you take something back. Reclaim? I don't know. Yeah, something. Yeah. Anyway, I, I I got to play this sort of mean character. And I think this show really did speak to a lot of victims of bullying, because this really did predate the anti-bullying movement. Yeah. Our understanding about how girls bully. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think this, and this was an outlet for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, well, again, I, I think probably a lot of people can relate, yeah. you know, a lot of women and as you say, some some men too, which is great. But I think a lot of girls can relate to um, feeling like Angela in relation to girls like Nanette. Yeah. And I think now we're all ch we are trying to understand girls like Nanette too, why they do what they do. Oh yeah, because they're in some kind of pain as well. Yeah. And we saw we saw that a bit with Nanette, which is that her mom, Bunny. Mm -hmm has obviously fallen prey to all of these stereotypes about how a woman should be. And they, you do get the sense that her parents put some kind of pressure on her to be perfect, yeah. right? And that's... To be this perfect little French girl when, in fact, she's not French at all. <laughs> no! So how can she do that? And then perfection is unattainable for anyone. So she was under her own kind of pressure. I think so, and I think you really see that. That's what I like so much about the design, that it is so ridiculous and so over the top and so doll-like that you could even make that argument mm -hmm. that mm. she was under this pressure to be a certain way she is. Oh, that's a great point. The, the doll-like um, mm -hmm. physiology of her character. I've never thought about that before. I have... Great point. Oh, thank you. Mm. On that note, yeah? actually, one of the only regrets of my entire life, oh, which no. had nothing to do with me, sadly, they were going to make, and I think they might have, like when they were doing all the merch, which was, you know, a few seasons into uh -huh. this story. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have some of it right here. <laughs> well, did they ever make, okay, so they were going to make a Nanette doll. Okay, yeah. and I have. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so they were going to make like a larger scale Nanette doll, and she was going to be a talking doll. Oh. And it would have been my voice recorded <laughs> on this toy. Um, for time in memoriam. <laughs> Darn it! <laughs> but they never, they never made and it. And she looks so dull like anyway. Yeah, that's a, yeah. yeah. These are cool. Oh, let's see this one. <laughs> yeah, that's a suction cup. Bug right off. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, there's a couple. I have I some merchandise. It. I have this cup. Hey, Nanette's on the cup. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Butt, Butt kisser. kisser. That's me It's now. so good. <laughs> All right, and these so, dress up, hey, she's on the dress up magnets. Yeah, that's very cool. That's yeah, true. I think I said that too. That she's so doll like. How come she didn't get a doll? Well, you know what's funny too. Oh, yeah. um, on a totally other note, total tangent here is. Yeah. Um, I I would venture to say the show was way more popular in the United States than it was in Canada. Really? So we didn't even see a lot of this stuff. 
I thought it was more popular in Canada because I got I didn't have this as a kid. I bought this all recently. <laughs> well, I mean, I just I don't know. Again, like there was so much of the production side of things that I was unaware of because of my age and whatever. Uh-huh. But um, and sort of the ins and outs of like how the production worked. So it was an American company, but it was right. made in Canada. So I have no like and what what was the network deal? What it was it aired on Fox Kids. It also and I had no idea where it aired in Canada. Teletoon. Teletoon, right. But just keep in mind, our population in Canada is so much smaller okay. that a lot of stuff like this doesn't even hit our market because there might be like, you know, there might be 10% of the fan base in Canada as there is here. Interesting, because I thought it was more popular in Canada and all mm. this stuff I got, I got from the UK. I know it was popular in Europe. Oh, really? I actually used to watch this in Switzerland. Wow, in English. No, in German. I, oh. I don't understand German, but I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. It was dubbed in German. It was. Right. It was dubbed in several languages. I knew that, yeah. Particularly, I know it was quite big in South America. Okay, that I didn't know. Yeah, I, I, I understand. At least, I think it was Chile. It was, like, on one of their huge mm-hmm. networks. Um, and that was, like, obviously great, but also it wasn't my voice <laughs> in right. all these other languages. Oh, and you, you could have dubbed <laughs> it into French. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I thought you could have. Maybe. My pronunciation wouldn't have been quite bang on. Aw. All the little French kids would have been saying, Mais oui, qu'est-ce que c'est? <laughs> she's fake French. I wonder, actually, I think somebody answered this since she's fake French in most every version, but what was the French version? Yes. What was she trying to be? Oh, yeah. They would have had to do some creative rewrites for maybe, all the different languages for her bad French. Maybe she's maybe she's in the, they're in the south of France, but she's trying to be Parisian. But she's actually from the States or something. Maybe. Who knows? I think that it would be great to ask a French person. Actually, I really should. <laughs> yeah. Someone answered that I a while ago. should reach out to one of the French Angela Anaconda people. Yeah. Because <laughs> most, most of the people watching my channel are either Canadian or German. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. It's most of the ones I know about. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, that's cool. Hi, Germany. Hi, Canada. I miss you. <laughs> Hi, Germany and Canada. <laughs> Let's see. Uh... Okay. On to Chris, I think. Yes, right? Chris, who writes really wonderful comments for me every week, and I enjoy reading, says, She worked on this as a child, right? It would be interesting to know how she experienced working on the show through the eyes of a kid, and also she was able to relate to Angela's character, or maybe Vanessa. Right. We did cover this. We did touch on it a bit, didn't we? Like yeah, we I did. said, because I was so much, well, at the time it felt like I was so much older than what the, the demographic mm-hmm. that they were aiming it at was, um... I, I mean, I never watched the show, I have to admit. Again, I was, you know, just whatever, a self-absorbed teenager. Yeah. Um, but so, but it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was funny because, like, all of us voice actors, mm-hmm. we were, they always used kids um, to do child characters. Really? It was very, it's very seldom that you see a situation like a Bart Simpson where it's an adult playing a kid because they you want it to sound as natural as possible. It's only the older characters that you get like character actors doing these funny voices. Um, but you have to be kind of old enough to understand what you're doing mm-hmm. and to be professional and all that stuff. Like some I mean I started doing voice acting when I was like 10 or 11 but that's kind of like the the low end of when kids really grasp what they're doing and so you're you're almost we were always playing characters that were younger than us okay um and uh but you still sound youthful enough to do it um right so through the eyes of a kid yeah I was always like oh this is like a fun cool show but this (laughs) isn't for me um and uh and then we we talked about relating to Angela and Annette and and all that stuff we covered it already we did and I thanks Chris Yes, thanks, Chris. I love your comments. Thanks to everybody, by the way. Um, Thank you. To Ed, to ZK Art, to Russell, to Hulkarine 100. To Brian Nussbaum. (laughs) Brian, Drew it. Oh, sorry, Stephen, Chris, William, and Amy. I think we didn't... I think Amy's was... Oh, there's two more. Yeah. Amy is... Oh, we we already did cover this. How she liked working on the show, what she thought of Nanette as a character. We did cover that. Yes, we covered Williams, too, didn't we? Yes. Um, did I like yeah, we voice did. acting and on the show? I loved it. Yeah. Super fun. I don't think we covered this one yet. This is from Trains a Thousand AJ. Why was Nanette so mean to Angela? Right. Um, well, I think we kind of talked about that a little bit too. Back yeah. to, um, 
you know, realizing that Nanette was under her own kind of pressure, she probably, I mean, I sort of believe that people who contort themselves into these, like, mm-hmm. heavy societal expectations don't always like themselves all that much because mm-hmm. it's not necessarily a very authentic state of being. Um, you know, like, I just saw um, an ad for the reboot of The Hills, which is maybe, like, a good real-life comparison okay. to girls like Nanette. Okay. And, uh... I don't know. I just, I wonder, I think there's always a disconnect when people maybe aren't necessarily, I mean, look, we saw that Nanette has this other side with the whole, like, bruiser rebellion (laughs) episode, right? That maybe she would like to pursue a different path, but she's got things pretty clearly charted out for her by other people. That's a good point. And Angela is such a free spirit, and she just lives her life the way she wants to. I mean, that's enviable. That's true. Actually, would you... We have seen a bit of a soft side to Nanette when she wants to give Angela the scarf in in one of the Secret Sand episodes. She wants to give her a scarf, but then, for whatever reason, we don't know why, backs out at the last minute. Oh. And there was another episode where they write letters to each other, which, how they don't know they're writing letters to each other, because you have to write the address on it, I will never know, but they... Like a, like a, um... Pen pals. Pen pal But thing. then, they don't know each other are pen pals, and they actually really get along before Nanette figures oh, wow. it out, and then gets embarrassed, and then has to be mean. See, there's so much yeah. that I just don't remember, and so it's great <laughs> that you guys are all keeping track of all of these things. <laughs> um, I would say that, uh, again... I think it's funny, like, sometimes the closer you are to a project, the more objectivity you have around it. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't watch the show, Mm -hmm. um, and I was just sort of in my little recording studio once a week saying my funny lines and and trying to nail them as best I could. And not becoming a waitress at a truck stop. (laughs) And not (laughs) being, yeah. Um, Although I did have a phase of my life when I was a waitress, so maybe that's our reflecting life. Oh. Nothing wrong with being a waitress. Not at all. Um, But but so, right, back to the sort of having the objectivity. I would say that, that there was, Again, one of the reasons why I think Angela Anaconda is such a like great, smart show is that that would have been an, um, an effort by the writers to bring people together and like expose the humanity in everyone, right? That really, I mean, not to get too, I don't know, prolific here or whatever it is, but um, not prolific, that's not the right word. But, um... It's okay, go deep, we can overanalyze all... <laughs> anyway, we we're obviously, like, in a very strange time in the world today where people are finding their differences outweigh their mm-hmm. similarities. But yes. I would say that stuff like the letter-writing episode is was an attempt from the writers to show kids mm-hmm. that even if you think you're really different than someone, you can find common ground. Oh. I mean, at the end of the day, it was still... A show for kids right Mm -hmm. and trying to I I would say that no one goes into writing or creating content for children that's gonna like make them worse people (laughs) there would always be some there's always some educational effort in there somewhere yeah so and actually one thing I really liked about the show it didn't feel like it had an agenda other than to be good and relatable that's a great agenda, isn't it? I think so. And to be funny. Oh, yeah, and to be and funny. To be funny. Well, there are some really funny lines in there. <laughs> and creative. It was, yes. again, it was such a creative show. I'm sure it was such a great creative outlet for the animators and the writers and, yeah, and for us. Yes. It was super fun. Cons- getting creative on how you can rearrange Nanette's face in the Revenge Fantasy or Miss Brinks's or Mark and Derek's. Now, I'm just looking back. Did we, I mean, we touched on... Uh, a lot of the stuff that Amy is wondering about, mm-hmm. but um, I would like to acknowledge her question for sure, which says, I'd like to, I'd maybe like to know how she liked working on the show or how she got the role and also what she herself thought of Nanette as a character. I think we answered all that, Amy. I, I hope you so. feel like the answer that was woven in amongst our, our conversations that other stuff. But again, um, I loved working on the show. It was like such a nice uh, escape for me. You know, I was high school student at the Mm -hmm. time and um I went to this school for kids with like outside commitments so other stuff that oh cool like there were lots of athletes but there were actors and dancers and people like that wow um some who've gone on to pretty big things I won't name names but um 
Anyway, oh uh, but so it was a flexible program where it was like, look, I do this thing every Thursday and um, so it was great. I got to leave school at lunchtime. I'd take a cab to the recording studio and I got to go inhabit this other world. That's really cool. Yeah. I think the last question, wanted to save this for the end, was so, you know I want to reboot the show. We've talked about this before. Right, right. But I personally want to reboot the show, bring it in into modern storytelling, mm -hmm. really showcase the importance of anger and this escapism and that it's really, there is a positive to being angry and it's okay and you can use that in a very positive way sure. while still not being a negative show. Yeah. And I love, while still having your imagination. And so if by some miracle DHX lets me do that, would you be willing to reprise your role as Nanette? <laughs> well... I would, I'm certainly game to, to be involved in any way, um, and I would not want to jump the gun by saying right. that, yes, I would love to be Nanette again, because frankly, it should probably be another kid, mm -hmm. but as we joked about, maybe I right. could play Nanette's mom or something, <laughs> although I don't know if I could do Bunny, Bunny Manoir, but... Um, we can redefine the character. I definitely... fit you. I don't even have to play Bunny. <laughs> um, maybe I just play the janitor. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I definitely wish you luck with, with rebooting the show. And, uh, and again, like I think that all of you guys out there who love and support the show and um, like I think, it's, I think it's really wonderful and I totally think it is still relevant and would be a great thing for kids these days to have on TV. Okay. So, yes. Good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. DHX, you know what to do. <laughs> Let's get this started. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for being My here. My pleasure. Thanks to everyone watching. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. See you when you see me.